Hi friends, yeah. how's everyone doing? My name is Ryan McGinnis, aka Ryquant on Twitter X. This is Punter Jeff, aka Mr. Jeff, the hyper bull on the Twitter street of micro strategy. And what we're gonna try and do today is like have a little fun explaining some of the nuance of micro strategy and what I would consider to be a very non-conventional sense. This is not Ben Graham and, and the intelligent investor. This is looking through game theory, probabilistic outcomes, and all of the relevant catalysts that are within this, um, this cycle for Bitcoin and how that's going to directly play to micro strategy. So my, my hope for this is that this is going to be the beginning of, of, of more videos to come because it would be impossible to talk about all this stuff in a, in one sitting. Um, so with that being said, let me go and uh, let me pass it over to Jeff for his, uh, his introduction, and then we'll kind of start uh, ripping through this stuff. All right. Nice to meet everybody informally. Uh, we're going to make this more of a little bit of a conversation, uh, Ryan and I, but uh, I'll give a quick intro of myself. My name is Jeff. Uh, I was a punter. That's what punter Jeff comes from. I played football. Um, but uh, a little bit of background, I have a business and economics dual degree, minor in math, uh, studied finance, and um, I'm currently a reinsurance broker. So I sell insurance to insurance companies, which is effectively tranching catastrophic weather risk and selling it to reinsurance companies across the globe. It's a global diversification of weather risk for hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, those types of things. So. I'm very familiar with capital markets, big money, how things move, insurance industry moves in cycles. So you got to think about interest rates and capital and opportunity cost and game theory and market size and stretches of risk and tranches and rates and all of these things. So um, I feel like that has given me a pretty good perspective and uh, pretty, good, pretty good perspective on the stock market. And I take a little bit of a non-traditional view of risk and probability. And that leads me to some of the theories that I've come up with on MicroStrategy and Bitcoin. Um, this is just a hobby of mine. I do not do this professionally. This is absolutely not financial advice. I'm not a broker. I cannot sell you shit. Don't really listen to me. I'm just doing this for informational purposes only. And this is what I do for fun at night. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll, we'll kick into it here. I'm gonna share my screen. It'll pop over here. Jeff, real, real quick, as you're sharing the screen, how far could you punt the ball? I know everyone's Ooh. thinking like... I had a 75-yarder. I had a 75-yard punt. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in my football career, I went 3-33. and So I punted a lot. Uh, we went defeated two years in a row. Uh, so a lot of punting. And uh, yeah, I had a 75-yard punt. We call it the punt heard around the world. I punted out of the back of the end zone. And I think we pinned them down on the 20 and we proceeded to win that game. So it was the, the punt that won the game, like one of our three wins in my four year career. So, uh, yeah. Now, here's a person who's been through adversity a couple of <laughs> defeated seasons, but also has defeated. the punt around the world. That is, that is neat stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen, Ryan? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, what I've got here, this is just kind of agenda, what we plan to walk through. After this, you probably won't be able to see this anymore, but I've got the intros covered. We're going to go into valuing an equity, like how do you value any equity, uh, efficient market hypo hypothesis, nominal bias, talking about share float, get into passively managed index funds a little bit, talk about net asset multiple theory and crowded trades. We're going to zoom out. We'll try to talk about who we think can catch micro strategy, which I, teaser, I don't think many people can. Um, and then one of the big questions is the sustained premium to their Bitcoin holdings. Um, seems like there's a lot of narrative on the Twitter space that MicroStrategy should only be trading at some sort of made up fucking number relative to their Bitcoin holdings. So I'm here to talk through that a little bit. And I, I, I disagree with that fundamentally. Um, so without further ado, uh, Ryan, unless you got anything else, I, I think I'm going to jump into kind of the the Excel sheet. Yeah, let me just double tap the um, not financial advice piece. Um, 
Jeff and myself are people who are very comfortable with risk, volatility, understanding the dynamics of change. And we in no way represent, you know, financial advice. None of this should be construed as that. I would kind of just put it in a fun way. We're like research nerds, love the intersection of math and finance and just we really dive deep into this stuff. So instead of just holding it for ourselves, and since there is a community out there on Twitter X, we're hoping to put these videos together. But again, none of this should be interpreted as financial advice. We should maybe put a disclaimer on all of the, the entire video. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's let's jump into it here. Let's ha let's have a little fun. Let's look at some math and look at some numbers because that's what I love to do. So this is probably a little small. Let's maybe make it a little bit bigger. Yeah. I'll okay. Okay. So uh, the what 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 you're looking at the screen here. This is uh, the top twenty U.S. equity comparison. Um, so this is comparing the top twenty U.S. equities, and we got MicroStrategy down there at the bottom. You'll notice that this data is a little bit dated because it's MicroStrategy there is at 546. They're now at 424. So this was only from like two weeks ago. So <laughs> uh, quite a quite a change in a couple of weeks. But you can see some conditional formatting over here on the right-hand side. This is ranked from market cap from high to low. And the, the point of showing this entire spreadsheet, we don't have to really get into the exact numbers. But the point of showing this entire spreadsheet is to show that there is no one single homogenous way to compare every single one of these top assets ranked in the entire market, right? You could look at PE ratios. Look at the PE ratios. They range pretty drastically. You've got some that have PE ratios of six. You've got some that have PE ratios of 120. And you've got everything in between, right? You've got some average number, but there's significant deviation from the average in PE ratio. And then you look at uh, multiples on net asset value, right? So what is their just fundamentally, what is their assets minus their debt or their assets minus their liabilities? And in, in, in that sense, you see drastic numbers there as well. So you see multiples on net asset values trading anywhere from you know, 1.6 all the way up to 69 or 260, right? So there's some significant variations in how these equities are valued. So why do I point that out? Like, what, what does that mean? Um, what I think that means is that all of these companies have fundamental different business models, right? They're all in different um, sectors and niche businesses with different types of assets, different types of liabilities, and different financial structures. Some take on debt, some leverage equity, and they all do things a little bit differently because their employees do things differently and they're operating in different market sectors. They all have different amounts of revenue. That the, the big one I think that's really important to point out is all of their assets that they hold are all different. They're all different types of assets that have different fundamental structures. In my opinion, uh, I think that uh, an equity is worth the productivity of the assets, right? Like how productive can you make the assets that you have, right? Whether that's warehouses or real estate or, um, you know, computers or data mining machines or, you know, what, whatever it is. I think the kind of fundamental idea of like productivity of what you have. Uh, is kind of what what I boil down like what an equity is worth. So then you zoom out, right? Let's let's think about this thing from like a even more macro perspective. Um, and you see you see companies like Microsoft, Apple, and Nvidia that are trading at significant multiples on their net asset value. So what does that mean, right? You've got let's look at Nvidia for example. You've got total assets of fifty four billion dollars, liabilities of twenty billion dollars. And they're trading at two billion at two trillion dollars. So they're trading at a sixty times multiple of their net assets. To me, what that what that shows is that this is a crowded trade of people thinking that Nvidia is going to be around for the next thirty years, and people want to hold Nvidia 
for 30, 40, 50, 60 years in their portfolio. And they're looking at some point way down the horizon and they're valuing the company today based on where they think it's going to be in the future. And so it kind of comes down to like efficient market hypothesis. I don't think markets are efficient. I think markets are wildly inefficient. I think there's room for volatility in any one direction on any of these things. And I think uh, we'll get into it, but we'll boil down kind of the fundamental structure that kind of props some of these really, really, really large equities up and, and what makes them maintain those large kind of market cap multiples. Um, one thing I did want to point out, and Ryan and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, and, and what makes MicroStrategy a bit unique, right? Obviously, MicroStrategy's assets, they have 193,000 Bitcoin. They have the most unique asset out of any of these companies that you see here on the top 20. But uh, I had a conversation with a, a guy earlier today, and he was talking about MicroStrategy's assets have a very, very, very low carry value. So the cost of holding the Bitcoin is incredibly low. It's not like real estate, right? Like real estate deteriorates. You have to maintain it. You have to pay property tax on it. And it has like a tax drag and there, there's drag and deterioration of assets that all of these companies hold. Now with MicroStrategy, having a majority of their assets in, an, in, in the best asset in the globe, I think most of us can agree on that. There's no drag on those assets or it's a very minimal drag on those assets relative to some of these other assets these other these other companies hold so brian i think you had an example that was pretty good it's probably worth sharing yeah i'm just gonna get in the habit of muting myself so none of my side noise impacts the video um but yeah so in in my corporate experience i i used to be thinking about this kind of stuff while you know, massively investing in Bitcoin and how that kind of changes your perception of things. But I mean, I've I've seen some of our manufacturing facilities, some in person and some only through like pictures and video walkthroughs. And at Bristol Myers Squibb, you'll have pharmaceutical equipment that's the size of my entire apartment unit in terms of whether it's a giant mixer that mixes all the raw ingredients together with the API and all the other micro uh, crystalline cellulose and mixes it together. And then that gets funneled into a, a pounding press where this one cylinder comes down and slams that into the form of tablets. And then it goes down the, the conveyor belt to be you know, the next step and we test it for firmness. And there's just, I mean, a monstrosity of, of hardware all over the place. All of this, you know, is dead. That's not going to have the return that, that Bitcoin has an appreciation value, plus the cost. And this is what Jeff was saying about the real estate impact, whether it's taxes, maintenance, depreciation value, you know, the hot water heater breaks, it has to be replaced. And you compare all of those things or the Bristol Myers Squibb, you know, pharmacy laboratory costs, which are high, especially high relative to the output of what they're going to get from that. And then you compare all of that, all of the decay of all of those things against something like Bitcoin, where the only taxable event, and I'm not a tax attorney, but really the only taxable event is selling. There's no maintenance costs. And that benefit can be passed on to the investing class, like guys like myself and Jeff, because there's no fees to hold micro strategy. So there's no friction or like fiat decay, so to speak, on our end as investors. And there's definitely not on, on micro strategy, the company. So that, that's how we have to compare these things. You know, there's, there's a no drag scenario with micro strategy and then all these other companies on the list have massive facilities and the upkeep and the tax on these sorts of things. And, and to be clear, every single one of these companies is leveraging their asset balance sheet uh, for financial strength. So they're using that asset portfolio to, as collateral to generate loans and uh, interest bearing vehicles to generate cash, to increase productivity. So, um, I think that's one thing that the investing community in on Twitter or X uh, seems to miss is that 
uh, they think in the future that MicroStrategy will have to sell their assets or sell the Bitcoin in order for it to be used or, or to generate value. But in the future, they will be able to use that entire portfolio of assets as collateral to generate cash flow, to increase operations and increase revenue and increase future cash flow down the road without selling a single asset. And that's, that's without even taking into consideration like the new finance, Bitcoin being the new financial rails of the new financial ecosystem, which, which might happen, you know, 12 to 16 years from now. But um, in the short and long-term horizon, that pile of assets is not going to be sold. It's going to be used as collateral. And I think that is a fundamental understanding of uh, finance that a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, that's what wealthy people do. <laughs> they they take debt out on their asset portfolios. So just keep that in mind. They don't have to sell their shit in order to like generate va generate value on it. Um, I think I think I also want to I, I also want to um, make one kind of uh, Bitcoin plug, and I think this is um, one thing that gave me a lot of conviction in the micro strategy trade was uh, having an on-chain Bitcoin network transaction. So going through the process of moving Bitcoin from Coinbase onto a cold storage wallet. And that whole process, everything that you have to think about in moving Bitcoin to cold storage gives you fundamental understanding of how like the whole concept works. You can see the math. You can you start asking a lot of questions about like wait how does this work and those how does this work questions answering those for yourself generates a lot of conviction for bitcoin and like kind of how micro strategy is managing things here so just kind of one of, my, one of my one plugs is to it's a it's an exercise worth doing if people haven't done that before uh i bet's great it's super simple it's easy you could press one click but actually under, understanding how things work really helps um cool all right that was a little side but uh we can get back into this one of the other things i wanted to point out on this is that you'll notice is all of these shares outstanding are vastly different and i think it might be helpful do a little conditional formatting so we can see this visually right Okay, so I think a lot of people get lost in this nominal bias thing too, right? So MicroStrategy's price is a $1,100. And you know, you talk about it going to $10,000 and people are like, no way, that's so high. There's nothing that's ever been $10,000. Um, and you, you really, they, they kind of get bogged down or lost in this kind of like nominal bias where like the, stop thinking about the share price and think about the market cap like the market cap of the company, which is the share price multiplied by how many shares there are. And when you when you start to zoom out and you look at these things, you can see that every single one of these companies has a significantly different amount of shares because in the past they've done share splits or, um, you know, one share now becomes 10 shares. And that's, you know, created more liquidity and reduces the price nominally, but the market cap may stay the same. So, I encourage people when, when you're when you're looking at companies, it's helpful to compare the market cap and not get caught up on, oh, that price seems expensive because it's eleven hundred dollars. Well, the company seems cheap because it's seventeen billion dollars and NVIDIA is at three trillion. So there's a lot of blue sky ahead of us in terms of where we could potentially go. Um anything else there, Ryan? Yeah, I'll, ha I'll have to come up with a better solution for the mute stuff so I can be quicker in and out. But um, yeah, okay. I mean, a lot of this stuff came up in the Tesla run. And I mean, it was just amazing. It was amazing to behold how quickly this thing could gap up from 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 to 4,000. And then stock would split down to like 400 or so. And then it would just start working its way back up into the thousands. So there's really no limit to how high these things can rip 
higher and and your point on the unit bias thing is so big but it's it's not true about like the real domain of markets and finance especially with how much money it would take to even move something like micro strategy now people aren't concerned with the share price if they're buying two percent of the company or three percent of the company you know Right. That's, that's such a good point on Tesla, right? I, it, it was so funny. I'm, I'm a big Kathy Wood fan. I, I like Kathy Wood. Um, but she came out with this $4,000 price target on Tesla. Yeah. And I was like, no way. Like, there's no way Tesla goes to 4000 Like, that's super expensive. But And this is before I even really started thinking like this. And then I was like, wait a minute. Uh, that's actually not that unreasonable when you think about what how much the company is worth and then of course it hits the four thousand dollar price target it just didn't look like four thousand it was like no. at 300 or something because the stock split uh right. wasn't what you know wasn't equal um so yeah it you can get lost in the unit bias um it's a 17 micro strategy is a 17 billion dollar company nvidia is a three trillion two trillion dollar company so there's there's a big big gap there um and okay. uh, and and just real quick dogecoin yeah. is like 12 billion <laughs> micro strategy 17 billion just just to put you know some kind of comparisons there jesus yeah Th- thanks elon yeah right oh my god um got a little whiskey here a little right. westland single a little westland single malt i don't know if anybody's a whiskey fan but a true gentleman good. over here yeah yeah i got my glen can too neat of course um Okay, so uh, what do we got here? Uh, this is I wanted to talk about passively managed index funds, and this is this is super fun. I, I love this shit. Uh, so, MicroStrategy is a is a trading equity on the Nasdaq, right? It is um, it is already included in multiple passively managed market cap weighted index funds. And I've got them highlighted here in green. So. VTI is the, so this list that you're seeing on the screen right now, this is the list of the top 20, uh, e, uh, top 20 publicly traded ETFs in the globe, ranked by assets under management. And you can see that the top five, the top three are S&P 500 passively managed index funds. The fourth one is a total stock market index ETF. And then the fifth one is the NASDAQ 100. So why is this important? Um, I, in, in my working experience, I have seen that, you know, I, I think 90, maybe it might be higher, 90% or more of folks who work in the corporate world and have a 401k or a pension fund, uh, and they get their paychecks, uh, paid into a 401k. You have options of passively managed index funds that you park that money into to save for a later date. Um, that money goes into these index funds at multiple intervals each month. Um, and many people just set it and forget it, right? You've got, they're earning, they're, they're mining their fiat. It's getting, they're getting paid. And it's going into these passively managed index ETFs and they don't even know what they're buying because they're buying a whole haystack, right? Why? Um, why pick the needle in the haystack when you could just buy the whole haystack and you can preserve your wealth for the future? Now, um, the to- so I, I did want to I want to pull these top ones up because these are these are very material. Um, but market cap weighted index funds, the, the way these work is um, so they they track all of the equities within a specified index, and so um, as a market cap of a specific company changes, it let's just say it increases, the relative weight of that increase or the, the relative weight of the company at the increased value will change the percentage allocation of any future dollars that are going into that index fund into buy side volume for the future of that company. So let me see if I can simplify that. For MicroStrategy, they're, let's just say their uh, uh, market cap is $10 billion, and then it goes to $100 billion. The relative weight of dollars from that index flows that are going to come in for MicroStrategy are going to be 10x because the allocation of um, funds is going to be significantly materially higher. So 
there's been a lot of conversation about S and P 500, right? Like they, they've currently, I think they currently hit all of the potential thresholds to get included in the S and P 500, right? They're they've hit the market cap threshold. There's some questions on earnings, whether it's like four quarters in a row or if it's four total quarters that has total earnings above a certain threshold. I don't know. Who knows? Ultimately, there's a committee that's got to approve every equity that goes into the market at the end of the day. And, you know, that's, you, very people on Twitter are saying uh, there's no way they're going to get included. I don't know if they're going to get, get included. And I think it doesn't really matter because they're already included in market cap weighted index funds. The S&P 500 and the, and the NASDAQ 100 and all of these other index funds that they could get added to are just uh, positive pressure. It's just, a, it's just more, it's just compounding the potential of the, the potential effect of passive buy side volume coming into micro strategy. So, um, what do some of these numbers look like? Let's do. Let's run through some examples and and kind of talk through it because I, I think um, the S and P five hundred I think is the most um, the most likely. It's got the smallest market cap threshold. They hit the earnings targets. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of controversy around Bitcoin. However, I think um, you probably have every incentive to add MicroStrategy to the S and P five hundred. Um, we can talk about that. That could probably be a whole 50 minute conversation on its own. Um, but let's talk about some examples. And um, so what we're gonna do here, so up here on the top, I've got a scenario tester. So looking at a allocation, um, so these are the S&P 500 market cap weighted ETFs. So each one of these tickers follows the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 makes a change to the asset allocation. These index following ETFs also make a change to their asset allocation and have to buy or sell assets in order to track the index, how it works. Um, and so then we look at weight. So let's let's do some examples of MicroStrategy getting included in the S&P 500 with some different weights and how, how, much, how much money would that um, shove into buying MicroStrategy so they could tra tra uh, track the index. So, um, Let's start with a low scenario or what do you think, Brian? U.S. bank scenario? Yeah, let's start with a low scenario, low plus U.S. bank. Um, so let's say their weighting is, um, let's say the market cap when they actually get added to the S&P 500 is 64 billion. They're currently trading at 17 billion. I would assume it might take a couple of quarters in order for S&P to kind of make a move. So I, I think the price of the market cap is gonna rise pretty drastically soon. So let's assume 64 billion um, as a base scenario. That would result in $1.9 billion of buy side volume from the S&P indexes, S&P ET, S ETF indexes, um, which would have to buy MicroStrategy and anybody investing in the S&P index would have no idea that they're buying MicroStrategy when they're buying the ETF. So this is passive money. You can't select like which equities you want when you invest in these passive ETFs. You invest in the ETF and it just does it automatically. It's bot, it's computer, it's low expense ratios. Um, it's a set it and forget it strategy forever. Um, so, so how would that impact MicroStrategy? A lot of people would think, Oh, that just increases the market cap by 1.98 billion. No, it doesn't. Um, and and what, what do we know about how market caps work? Um, I gave an example here on the right hand side. So this is the this is the order book. This is the Robin Hood order book. Um, so you can see bid and asks on both sides. So on this day in particular, uh, the price of MicroStrategy was at $997. And you were able to see the depth of the um, ask price for MicroStrategy. So the depth was um, $29 million of buy side volume would move the price from $997 to $1,053. So going from $997 to $1,053, 
changes the market cap of MicroStrategy by $957 million. So $29 million increases the market cap by $957 million. So doing that multiple, the market cap increases by 33 times for every dollar of inflows in this scenario. I think that it might get a little bit more drastic the further you go out here, because I know there are a lot of Bitcoin bulls that know what's going on here. And I think it's going to be a little bit lopsided. So I'm, I'm sure everybody, so the same concept here is this is the Bank of America 118 multiple model that is talked about a lot on, on Twitter and you know everywhere. It uh, comes up a lot. Um, that, that we might get a 118 multiple scenario because it, it may it may follow a similar similar concept in the threshold. So I looked at a couple examples here, right? Like, and this all flows through. So in this scenario, where you've got a 0.15 percent allocation uh, in the S and P index, resulting in 1.9 billion dollars of passive buy side volume, if the multiple stays the same on market cap. That would result in a $65 billion change in market cap, which would be an additional increase in the price of MicroStrategy of $3,800. Now, here's the flywheel effect, right? So if that, if that results in an increase of the market cap by $65.5 billion, and the index needs to rebalance with an increased market cap of $65 billion, you can start to look at, all right, well, maybe the maybe the market cap that they should represent in the index is, is materially higher. Maybe it's 0.39% weight of the S&P 500 market, market cap. So any, any, any future $1, any $1, uh, what is that? Um, 39 cents would go to MicroStrategy. That's, that's kind of that's kind of how it would work. Well, let's let's look at that view. So in that scenario, the numbers are the, the scale gets crazy really quick. Um, then you're looking at 5.1 billion dollars of passive buy side volume. And these are people that don't even know they're investing in MicroStrategy. Uh, at 5.1 billion dollars with a 33 times multiple, you're you're looking at a nine thousand dollar increase in the price. If you're assuming the same kind of depth multiple that we just kind of that exercise we walked through. Now, it could get crazier, right? Like you could skip, you could skip many price points here. Like the price of MicroStrategy might go from, if the S&P thing happens, it could go from 5,000 to 10,000 and just skip everything in between. And that, that might, that, that multiple might be a different effect. So you could see a multiple of 50 or 75 or 118, and you could see how drastic uh, the depth and the, the depth of the order book uh, changes the outcome. And ultimately, this is kind of this like passive flywheel thing where the market cap gets higher and the underlying Bitcoin gets higher, then they get a higher level, uh, higher participation in the index. And then, uh, then the price of MicroStrategy goes up and then they raise more capital because they issue more shares and then they buy more Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin goes up and then just keeps like going up um, kind of in perpetuity. So, uh, right, that's, that's a lot, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Um, and then, so that's just the S&P 500. In the meantime, you've also got all these other indexes that they're probably included in, which are um, Russell 1000, um, S and P mid cap information technology, and you've got the Invesco QQQ, which is the Nasdaq 100. Again, look at these assets under management. I mean, this is like they're insane. These are huge. These are huge, 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 huge funds. Where <clears throat> I think, let me be clear: this isn't just retail investors that are investing in these things. These are corporations that hold equities on their balance sheets. It's insurance companies. Insurance companies when they're taking premiums in they are investing those premiums into bonds and equities to pay for future liability. Insurance companies are buying stocks, pension funds, schools, 
endowments, corporations, all of them want to preserve wealth. One of the easiest ways to preserve wealth is investing in a market cap weighted index. So this isn't just 401ks we're talking about. We're talking about systemic uh, industry money is going, is flowing into these index funds. And it's not going to stop. Like it's not going to stop at any point in the future. So when people say that there's no way that that MicroStrategy will trade at a constant multiple of their Bitcoin holdings, I think is a crock of shit because there is this phenomenon that exists where you're going to have passive money that's flowing into this equity. And just the thought, just the concept, the concept of that alone will make MicroStrategy trade at a higher multiple of its Bitcoin holdings. Because conceptually, you know, as the market cap rises, more money will be flowing in. And this is something that Bitcoin doesn't currently have, right? Like Bitcoin isn't included in market cap weighted indexes. Uh, MicroStrategy is very unique in that they are included in market cap weighted indexes and they, they receive this passive flow of money just by being one of these entities. So uh, I think that kind of gets into the net, like, let's see, let's do some, let's do some prices. Let's, let's talk prices and, and <laughs> see about where this can go, which gets kind of fun. Um, Ryan, anything to add on this before I, before I flip over? Oh, maybe I'll, I'll just do a quick, um, I'll just throw in a, a number for NASDAQ 100, right? If uh, NASDAQ, if MicroStrategy gets added at a $62 billion market cap about where PayPal is today, they would get a 0.48% allocation to the NASDAQ 100. This is real money, everybody. That's $1.2 billion additional. And again, you start throwing in these multiples and uh, this is a really crowded trade. And if there are a lot of people that are holding MicroStrategy, like retail investors, and you've got Bill Miller and these hedge funds, you've got Adam Back, you've got a lot of people are holding very material shares here. And it's about to get really crowded. And everybody knows it's going to get crowded. And if everybody knows it's going to get crowded and there's nothing you can do about it, then let's see where it could go. Anything to add, Ryan? Yeah, and I mean, speaking of uh, crowd hit and people involved, I mean, look, Doc flipped back into the into the call options just you know yesterday at 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 a thousand bucks a share. So, I think just to build off of that, there's there's a ton of hedge funds out there who's all, like some are known and many of them are unknown because they're just private entities or guys like collaborating with each other who they don't care about the whole like saving the world stuff, which like I do, I think Jeff does, but like, they're just like alpha only hedge funds. And they see this, they see this with the, the S and P 500 inclusion and quick point on that. Um, th those who say that like, it's never going to happen. I think that's never going to happen because <laughs> The, the, the whole point of like the concept of the S&P and the NASDAQ 100 as an ETF form is that it's the ultimate momentum strategy for people who don't feel like being involved in finance whatsoever, including listening to earnings calls, going through documentation and stuff like that. Because the momentum factor there is that the losers get kicked out and the winners get kicked in. Like we saw with SMCI and you and I were just talking about that offline. And there, there's no conceivable scenario to me that many insiders did not. And I'm, I don't just mean insiders at the company. I mean, Wall Street. I mean, the Nancy Pelosi types, so to speak, who have an information asymmetry. There's simply no way that that wasn't known by some people with the stock like tripling in a month and being up almost 5000 percent over the past five years. Um, and then with this, with, with all this buy side money here, like we're looking at a total of 6.420 billion. Of course it came out to that number. <laughs> um, life is a comedy. I see those things all the time, but, um, 
that's that's kind of similar to the dynamic of the days to cover for the shorts right like which i think right now the days to cover is about three days for micro strategy meaning if all if all of the volume traded was shorts buying back and no like new long positions no one else front running anything just the shorts covering their positions it would take three days of typical volume for them to complete that and that's why that 3 million share short count can cannot just be viewed as like a dollar for dollar like increase to the market cap because they're competing with everyone else who's buying the shares whether it's the hedge funds like i said whether it's some of the big names that you mentioned whether it's people front running the S&P 500 um and then the last thing on this is that these S&P 500 and Nasdaq 100 folks they're buyers at any price. Talk about like the ultimate price insensitive buyer. So that's kind of why I'm in the camp of hoping that this gets delayed. And just to finish up on the point with um, that, the, the reason that I think it's only a matter of time, it's not like whether they may or may not get involved is because when post FASB occurs, there's a chance that the soonest that could occur, and I think some folks on Twitter are talking about this happening in this upcoming earnings call, which may or may not take place in Vegas. Even if they were in this call to announce the, the full switch to FASB, I still think it's going to take 12 months for the trailing 12-month numbers to settle out and to have the uh, four consecutive quarters of gap profitability to your point about like that, that's my understanding. It's four consecutive quarters of gap profitability plus the market cap hurdle. And since we're at 424 now, being meaning the 424th biggest company in the US by market cap, it's, it, it, it's really only a matter of time. And I'll close this portion by saying, a lot of the things that me and Jeff are gonna talk about are very compelling like individual catalysts but the real secret sauce is like all of these things being combined at the same time. And there's a number of different topics that we're going to get to, like the sailor premium and what having the number one, you know, because Doc made that list. Sailor's the number one most followed person in, in all of crypto Twitter, not just even the subset of Bitcoin Twitter. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. But the point there is like it's the sum of the parts and all of the individual parts, the catalysts happen to be extremely compelling by themselves and the real stories bringing them all together, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and, and there's there's one word that I, that I really want to touch on there and it's front running. Um, this phenomenon has happened in other stocks before and uh, most analytical data will indicate that you can't front run index trades. Now, this scenario is unique because if they get added to the S&P 500 index or any index, or as the market cap is changing, the underlying value of Bitcoin may be at the beginning of the bull market, or it may be at some sort, maybe at some different point in the bull market. So the holders of MicroStrategy may be continuing to hold, thinking that Bitcoin is going to continue to go higher. And knowing that we've got the infinite money printer, depending on your horizon on this trade, if it's a five-year, seven-year, 10-year horizon, um, you're not incentivized to front run and sell to the S&P pa passive 500 index um, uh, buy side volume you're incentivized to just make this trade super crowded. Like I'm not selling, I'm not selling my shares to passive investors here. Uh, I'm, I'm holding for the long term, and because I know this is going to be a super crowded trade. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to hit on people wonder, has, has this ever happened before? Uh, and the, the closest, the best comparison is Tesla. And Tesla was added to the S&P 500 in, I think it was November of 21. There was an article came out, said 22, 2020, 2020. Yeah, it's 20, ah, it's, it's all fucking blur. Um, 2020. Uh, so when it was announced, 
that Tesla was going to be added to the S&P 500, um, their underlying market cap had gone from, you know, very small to 300 billion. So it became a very crowded trade before they were even going to be added to the S&P 500. Now, they weren't added in, for that long period, even though they meet, met the market cap threshold, they didn't have positive net earnings. So they had ne negative net earnings leading up to it. And then they had a couple of quarters of positive net earnings. And after, right after the fourth quarter of positive net earnings, they got added to the S&P 500. And it was super controversial because there was no company ever in history that had been added to the S&P 500 index at such a high valuation. They were valued at 300 billion. And you can look at it here um, that like uh, 300 billion, you're one of the top 10 companies in the entire index. So you're, you're going to have... Let's just do it for fun. Let's just use the 600 billion as an estimate. I mean, they probably had somewhere to the tune of $10 billion that were flowing into Tesla and they, they like nobody can stop it. Um, and the, the market cap of Tesla went from 300 billion to 600 billion in a month, a month and a half. It 2 x it went up 300 million, 300 billion. Um, so you could, you could look at it, like go, you, there's articles, you could find the S&P article where it came out and you can see time stamped November and then like in January, <laughs> it's $600 billion company. So, um, I think that phenomenon could potentially happen here as well. Somewhere the scale may not be the same. It might, who knows, who knows where it goes. Um, Anyway, let's uh, let's do some price targets, huh? Should we, should we walk through those? Let's have some fun. This is where this is the this is the fun math stuff. <clears throat> okay, a lot of numbers here. So, um, on the left hand side, and this is just the way I look at it. This is a, an off the wall metric. I know you can take a power law theory of like velocity, right? Like thinking that MicroStrategy trades at a two times multiple relative to the percentage change of what Bitcoin is. But you can do this a hundred different ways. This is just the way I chose because um, I think they have the most valuable assets on the planet. And I want to look at how their assets, how many assets they have relative to how much debt or liability they have. So um, MicroStrategy owns 193,000 Bitcoin. Uh, the price today is 62,000. Their assets are worth 11.9 billion. Their liabilities are two and a quarter. And so their net asset value is 9.7 billion. Publicly available flow to 17.1 million. People are going to argue with me about this number. It doesn't fucking matter. It's small. Like, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the share price is 1,079 uh, and the market cap is 18.4 billion. So currently it's trading at 1.9 multiple of net assets. So in this scenario over on the right hand side, I, I test a few different Bitcoin prices, assuming a constant multiple of net assets uh, to get to a market cap, right? Just assuming it, it the, the net asset multiple stays constant. So in looking at a, a Bitcoin price of 150,000, you've got assets of 28.9 billion, liabilities of two and a half billion, Net assets of twenty six point four billion. Uh, in in running this math, two times twenty six point four gets you fifty two point nine billion, which would result in a microstrategy price of three thousand and ninety four dollars. Um, fast forward, right? Like, there's a lot of volatility here. Uh, you know, the, people are talking about the price of Bitcoin going up a hundred thousand. Uh, the Omega candle moving $100,000 in a day. We could go from 150,000 to 250 or 500. Um, and we've got a Samson Mao Omega theory too. We'll, we'll throw that in here at the end. Um, but with a $500,000 price scenario, using a two times multiple, you can see the micro strategy share price in this scenario gets you to about 10,000, about 10 or $11,000 in this, in this multiple. Now, what do we know? We know that there's, potential massive buy side, passive buy side volume on the horizon with the changing market cap. 
and the potential for this to become a very crowded trade and the multiple of net assets to rise drastically. In the past, um, in the prior bull run, after MicroStrategy announced that it purchased Bitcoin, uh, the, the net asset value of MicroStrategy increased to six times. So the, the multiple became six times. So the price of MicroStrategy was, the, the market cap of MicroStrategy was six times the net assets that they held in their Bitcoin treasury. So let's look at a couple different multiple perspectives. Um, and maybe it makes sense to just start by like going back to this uh, multiple assessment, right? Like companies across the entire market trade at different multiples of their net asset value. Again, all of these companies have different types of assets and they operate differently and they have different niche environments and different types of revenue streams, et cetera, et cetera. So this can be looked at in many different ways. Um, you can see like Berkshire Hathaway is trading at 1.6. JP Morgan is trading at 1.7. Those are not sexy assets to me. Um, but you can see some of these more sexy companies, uh, Microsoft, Apple, and NVIDIA are trading at materially higher multiples. Uh, again, we can argue about revenue and shit. Right? Like the assets are going to be used to create more revenue in the future. Guaranteed. Um, so we're going to, we're going to look at a couple different multiples and, and how that, how that <laughs> impacts the price. So if you're looking at a four times multiple of net assets, again, this is less than most of the companies on that page. You could see with a $150,000 Bitcoin price, um, estimated share price for MicroStrategy of 6,000, $250,000 Bitcoin price, 10,700. Now, again, zooming out, right? Like this, as the market cap increases and the value of the assets increase, you get more relative proportion of the market cap weighted indexes. You've got passive buy side volume. You've got Bitcoin bulls coming into the trade. You've got, um, and then potential short squeeze, right? If anybody that's short on this, um, I think I think the cost to borrow right now is incredibly cheap. And I think personally, my opinion is we are incredibly far away still from a potential short squeeze because I think collectively the entire, uh, the entire short market on MicroStrategy is maybe maximum $2 billion in the hole. And that's probably split up like amongst 15 different hedge funds. And when you zoom out and you think about the size of these hedge funds and splitting that $2 billion loss amongst all these different hedge funds, it's probably not even showing up on the radar of their quarterly or monthly reports. And these finance folks have their heads so far in the sand that they probably won't recognize this until it becomes a big issue. Kind of like what happened with GameStop. And as, as we've seen here, right? Like the exit velocity potential is pretty drastic. I think we can see some drastic moves pretty quickly. Um, and all of those, uh, all of those components, um, kind of work together, and it's kind of this. I, I, I've really, I've really tried to, I've tried to break this uh, multiple times, and think, and like Jeff, you're an idiot. There's no way. Like, there's no way. This is crazy. Um, I could be wrong, right? There's obviously black swan events that can happen that can break this trade, things that we can't control, government intervention, 6102, you know, all of these different things can happen. But, you know, knowing what we know, potential quantitative easing on the on the horizon, interest rates coming down, short squeeze, passive buy side volume, Bitcoin bull market, um, all of these different things happening at the same time, election, all these things happening at the same time is incredibly compelling. So let, let's look at a six times multiple, what MicroStrategy was trading at uh, for about a week in 2021 when they hit their, um, hit their peak. Uh, at a six times multiple um, with a $250,000 Bitcoin price, you're looking at a $16,000 price for MicroStrategy at a $274 billion market cap. Again, if the price market cap goes up, it's just this circular thing. You get a higher proportion of allocation in S&P 500 and, just, and like you, you keep the wheel going again. And one, one concept 
this this person posted yesterday that uh, I'm just buying MicroStrategy and any gains I take on MicroStrategy, I'm going to sell and then buy IBIT. And that was just a hilarious concept to me. Uh, I had a ton of fun thinking through that in that you're going to sell MicroStrategy and buy another asset, which increases the price of that alternative asset that in fact increases the value of MicroStrategy. And you're going to pay 20 basis points to make that move and probably a taxable event. So it seems like an ass backwards trade uh, when, if you know that phenomenon exists, why would you make that trade uh, when you can hold micro strategy uh, in perpetuity? So it's, um, it's a strange uh, concept to wrap your heads around. But I think this is something that big money is well aware of. And they probably already have their Bitcoin strategy solved. Like they're probably already holding plenty Bitcoin, GPDC, or uh, Bitcoin in a some in an A1 portfolio, but then using micro strategy shares to leverage the returns in excess of their Bitcoin strategy. So um a lot of people ask me, like, what's the best allocation of Bitcoin or MicroStrategy? I'm like, I can't answer that. Um, and it's like not an, not anything that I can have responsibility of, of answering to anybody or like, should I buy shares or calls? Like, I can't fucking answer that. That's something that needs like deeply, deeply, deeply personal that needs to be considered um, very strongly and you have to make your own conviction with your own trade based on your understanding of bitcoin and your understanding of the macro environment and all of these other things that are going on um so <laughs> this is where it gets fun i i, I think um i'm gonna go i'm gonna roll down obviously there's a lot of math here i've, I've done multiple i've looked at eight times multiple amazon's trading at a 10 times multiple you see these values are like micro strategy at 26,000 54,000 83,000 14 times multiple, which is where Microsoft is at. Now, this is where I'd like to stop and spend some time. This is the GameStop squeeze. So with GameStop, <clears throat> um, when it hit its peak uh, in 2021, that's it, January 21. Uh, when it hit its peak in January 21, it was trading at a 49 times multiple of its net assets, right? This was a monumental squeeze that we saw on on uh, with retail tra traders piling in. Highly recommend watching the movie Dumb Money. Uh, I was part of that trade. I was able to help put this roof over my head because of that trade. Um, and it was kind of hard to fathom what was going on. And, and, it, and it required a lot of game theory through the whole process. And I think you can argue that the trading multiple should have been much higher <clears throat> than 49 times net assets because it was very clear that there was manipulation that was going on to save the hedge funds that were uh, in deep shit. And in my game theory of that process, I had a material amount of GameStop shares and I had to game through game theory <laughs> the way through um, thinking how every single player holding GameStop was thinking. So you had this big chunk of passive money that's not going to move. You've got hedge funds who are really smart and educated and they don't need the 10,000% returns that the retail traders really want. They're okay with 200 or 300% returns. And it was in their best interest to exit at that point. Once there was manipulation going on and they knew that um, sentiment had been broken. That was all that needed to happen. Sentiment needed to be broken. And that resulted in kind of this fall, right? Anyway, it was trading at a 49 times multiple. And looking at the screen at a 49 times multiple, seems crazy, but if we get into a squeeze scenario, it could be realistic. <clears throat> With $150,000 Bitcoin price, you're looking at micro strategy price that's laughable, right? 75,000 75, or a $1.2 trillion market cap. Seems nuts. Now, um, for those of you history buffs, I encourage you to go look at the 2008 Volkswagen short squeeze. 
Um, and the 2008 Volkswagen short squeeze is, is really interesting. Um, there are a lot of weird market dynamics. It was shorted like way too high, like GameStop was, but yada, yada. But at, at one point, briefly, momentarily, Volkswagen was the most valuable company in the entire market because of the short squeeze. Um, now, gotten a bunch of shit for saying like, for even relating this to GameStop because GameStop was like 200% shorted and this is only 20% shorted. And uh, my caveat to that is, uh, this, is a this is a completely different trade. <laughs> this is a very completely different trade, right? Like GameStop had retail stores that were dying um, and they're, <laughs> they had real estate, they had video games and they were definitely on the way down. Um, but people banded together because they loved their video games and they loved going to their local GameStop. Now, this scenario is a little different, right? <laughs> Maybe a lot different because you've got MicroStrategy who holds 193,000 Bitcoin of the, the best asset on the planet, best performing asset on the planet with zero tax drag and zero decay. <laughs> so um, I don't think the, the shorts... Uh, whoever's short here is going to be able to potentially close out their positions ever. I don't think Bitcoin's going to zero. And if this is trading at any sort of multiple in excess of the Bitcoin value, I think it's hard to imagine a situation where the shorts can recover from this. And if the price moves this quickly on them, which it could, uh, theoretically, um, they could be chasing their tail really fast uh, into some very massive numbers that can put uh, these hedge funds out of business and transfer generational wealth that's built, been built over centuries uh, into the hands of people that are in trades similar to this. Um, again, this is not financial advice, but it's a, it's a concept that has a probability that's greater than zero. And I, I think it's worth considering uh, that probability. It might be two and a half percent. It might be one percent. I don't really know what that number is, but um, I think it needs to be considered. Uh, so these numbers are crazy, right? And it gets even crazier. <laughs> uh, 60.5 times multiple. You've got N NVIDIA is trading at a 60.5 times multiple on their net assets. And you look at a $250,000 Bitcoin price and you see a MicroStrategy share price of 160000 and you know $500,000 Bitcoin price and a MicroStrategy share price of 332000 And you start looking at these market cap numbers, and they're really hard to fathom, right? $2.7 trillion, $5.6 trillion. Jeff, that, you're fucking crazy. That's the, that's the, high, that's the largest company uh, by market cap ever in the history that's ever been traded, and right now they're at $17 billion. You're insane. Um, I get it. <laughs> I, I totally get it. Um, but when you think about MicroStrategy's holdings, you got 193,000 Bitcoin. Uh, I can, and I kind of want to go back to this for a second. When you think about MicroStrategy holding 193,000 193, Bitcoin, when you, when you zoom out and you, you take a, Take a view. Who can catch this company? Who can buy 193,000 Bitcoin and catch MicroStrategy? I think there are probably eight to 10 companies in the world right now that could potentially, with their cash on hand or their financial leverage, generate enough money to buy 193,000 Bitcoin. That's probably one of these top 10s here. Now, what do we know about Bitcoin, right? Like, uh, it's the, the depth of bidders and, and people bidding and people asking prices for Bitcoin are, it's pretty shallow. And if MicroStrategy's Bitcoin holdings are worth $12 billion right now, if somebody wants to buy 193000 it's not it doesn't cost $12 billion to buy their holdings. It would cost probably $40 billion at today's prices because as they start to buy, it would drive the price up 
of Bitcoin progressively. So it would take a number that's significantly higher than 12 billion to buy the same quantity of Bitcoin that MicroStrategy holds. Now, those companies would have to start today. Those top 10 companies would have to start today and then have to probably start be buying today. Now, if the price of Bitcoin runs away quickly, which is which it's done, um, and we get to 100,000 before the halving, all of a sudden that $40 billion needed to buy Bitcoin to buy to catch MicroStrategy, that 40 billion turns into 150 billion. There might only be one company on the planet, one or two companies on the planet that can do that. <laughs> and these companies have to move fast, like yesterday. And so when you zoom out and you start thinking about should MicroStrategy be the most valuable company on the planet? I think you can make the argument that nobody is going to catch them. And if you think this is the best asset in the world, in the planet, and they hold multiples more than the next closest company and the next closest company could ever potentially hold, then I don't think that them being valued as the most valuable company on the planet is wildly unreasonable. And you can say, Jeff, $5.6 trillion. I mean, that's fucking gold's market cap. You're insane. Well, $5.6 trillion, that's a synthetic figure. It's not actually real dollars because the price, uh, in order to get to $5.7 trillion, we might skip like, uh, we might skip fifty thousand dollars just by pe people don't want to sell their micro strategy. So there might the price just might be driven up because people want to hold on to it forever because they know that this this whole phenomenon exists. Um, and this kind of gets into the Bitcoin holding mindset as well, where if I sold this, where else would I put it? <laughs> like what what other equity would I put it in? Um, I could put it in Bitcoin, but if I put it into Bitcoin, then it just makes MicroStrategy go up higher. <laughs> and um, maybe at some point, like, as, as, as value gets evaporated from the existing market um, to buy these other equities, and as, as the whole market is getting repriced in Bitcoin, um, there could be some transitions away from this. But I don't... <laughs> Do I think this is insane? Absolutely. Do I think there's a probability greater than zero that this happens? Absolutely. Um, and it's fun to think about. And and uh, I'm going to kind of close with this uh, last scenario, which is uh, the Samson Mao million dollar Bitcoin, which uh, is just, it's so fun to, I love to like throw my brain around it. But um, let's, let me, let's take a, maybe a lower multiple, maybe not the GameStop or the, maybe the GameStop one, sure. But if you're looking at, a million dollar Bitcoin, you got 193,000 trading at a GameStop multiple. You're looking at a nine tr $9 trillion company uh, with a $545,000 micro strategy price, which is just fun to contemplate. Um, with something with that much upside, <laughs> is it's fun to be a part of. And um, I'm having a lot of fun in this trade. And uh, it's uh, it's definitely created infinite game theory scenarios where you're walking through you know what are these potential options like what can happen um so uh, do i think micro strategy can sustain a premium this, this term this premium to their underlying bitcoin holdings absolutely absolutely they will and they will because of all of these phenomenon that we just walked through this is this is like systemic financial structure phenomenon. So don't try to put some premium trading bullshit. Don't try to make something up out of thin air because all your models are fucking broken. Right. Um, this phenomenon has literally never happened in human history before. Like a company shifting their <laughs> corporate treasury from one money to a different type of money that's going to outperform all other money to the nth degree in perpetuity. And, and they have 10 times more than anybody else. <laughs> like that scenario is just it, like unfathomable. So you have to fathom the unfathomable. Like <laughs> it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a probability that's greater than zero.
that, that's the way I think about things. So, um, you got anything to add, Ryan? I just I just went on a serious monologue there. Nothing to add. I think I might sign off Twitter permanently because, like you said, you know, <laughs> there's there there's nothing to add. Um, I do I do have a quick couple things to to run through just to just to comment on on that portion, and I hope what gets across from like everything just Jeff just said, which it definitely got across for me, is that. This whole notion of the premium and discount discussion, whether we're using just the Bitcoin or the Bitcoin and the value of the underlying business, I mean, it it just misses the point so much. And if you can go back to the table that had all the multiple of net asset values. Oh, yeah. This is and and before I get into that, I, I see this conversation come up nonstop on Twitter with people saying like they were saying this at 700, just like a week ago when it was at 700 saying like sell more shares, you know, like they're pounding the table on this kind of stuff. And it's like, if we're using this very linear understanding of like a spreadsheet that just prices everything out now, it's going to miss the point. And on this here in column P as in Papa, uh, for those, you know, the, the phonetic military alphabet, um, I think this is a rather extraordinary way of looking at things in such a way that like the, like I mentioned at the top of the call, the Ben Graham philosophy would just never understand this. And that, and part of that is because finance is much more sophisticated than just looking at like which stock has a cheaper like price to earnings or multiple on net asset value. And then just going with, with the cheaper one. But even just looking in terms of how the numbers are right here, if I'm seeing micro strategies at 2.5, right? But the tech titans of which we could kind of conceivably see micro strategy being in the tech titans because of this monopoly strategy that they do have. And I'm gonna finish on multiple net asset value, but the, the other thing to bring in here in terms of the monopoly, like you were saying, Jeff, could a company catch, could a company not catch? I look at the top 10 and the only one that jumps off to me who could do this and would do this would be Meta. But the, the thing that Meta, because they have you know a, a chairman as a CEO who owns a ton of voting shares and is kind of like politically against the state, so to speak. So you could see him having a motive to do something like this. But even if they did buy Bitcoin and even if they bought as much as, you know, MicroStrategy has, they will never, and I mean never, have the percentage of their assets be such a mass be Bitcoin in size. And I kind of butchered that in saying it, but I know you get what I'm saying. Micro, the value of MicroStrategy is roughly, and don't beat me up on the numbers, but roughly 80%, let's say, give or take about 5%. If... Meta put, you know, $20 billion worth of, of Bitcoin on the balance sheet at roughly a trillion dollar market cap. I believe that that's 2% if, if my math is right on the order of magnitude math there. So meaning, like, why does that matter? That matters because Meta won't trade as a Bitcoin instrument because it's the value of it, like Jeff was saying, like the value of an equity is the productivity rate, the productivity level of your assets, they'll never be priced as that. They'll be priced off, off their net income and their earnings and all that stuff. Whereas something like MicroStrategy that is just levered long this stuff to the gills with like a very seasoned financial and technology operator running it, um, there's, there's nothing that, that could catch that. Now, what some people would say to that is they, they'd actually probably bring up something like GameStop, because if Ryan Cohen was like, I'm going to load the boat on Bitcoin, um, maybe they could end up getting the numbers somewhere around there. But number one, no one considers, Ryan, I, I think he's a great person, but no one considers him like a serious thought leader visionary in the way that they, they would perceive Sailor. Plus, it's just it's just such a meme stock. But anyway, if, even if like a smaller, let's say, company that's way past his prime, a la GameStop, not much, you know, future earning potential there. If they were to do something like this, it would never have the micro strategy 
founder is a chairman, it would never have their um their cost basis, which which like I said, I believe we're at thirty one thousand for micro strategy. Like they would never get that. They would also most likely never take on the aggressive leverage posture. So the reason I say all of that to describe the monopolistic attributes that micro strategy very much has. And then we look at this through the lens of multiple on net asset value where, you know, micro strategy two and a half at the bottom, and there's plenty in the tens, twenties, thirties, you know, well above it. I think Home Depot is an absolute outlier on this. Although Home Depot is, I, I call it Bull Depot. It's gone up over a million percent on its all-time charts. That, that's kind of an outlier there. But like you look at Eli Lilly, it's like, you know, they sell a weight loss drug. It, it's cool. Eli Lilly, I think they're going to a trillion dollars in market cap. But and and, and because and, and and because and because they're gaining right because they're because they're pushing up and they're gaining they're getting that rebalance effect of the passive indexes yes. where more additional dollars that come in the door are getting disproportionately contributed to those higher companies so that's what that's what happens with these companies that are up up top that are really weighted up top is they're super crowded and by being crowded, they know everybody that holds those, like Warren Buffett holds Apple. He, why? Because he knows it's a crowded trade. He knows it's a super crowded trade. And that's why he feels so confident on it. It's like people are going to buy iPhones forever. And and people want to buy the equities. People want to buy the equities of the things that they buy. Um, and he knows that. And he knows that he knows how the system works. And the system works why, uh, with passive money getting invested in perpetuity right? <laughs> forever. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I like I like looking at it that way. Uh, and just for the record, I, I looked up um, Meta. Meta's got sixty five billion dollars in cash on hand, so they could theoretically do it. Maybe maybe Zuck's getting orange pilled while while we speak somewhere after he does his uh, Tai Chi or whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or he does his like metal smithing, um, <laughs> the blackjack type stuff. But I yeah. mean, even but here here's the thing: Meta just recent, and not to get too lost on this one example, but Meta just recently on the last earnings call initiated a dividend for the first time, and that's big for a company because usually once you start a dividend, it never ends. Meaning, like more cash is going to go to that theoretically. Also, the the best thing that a Meta shareholder could do at this point would be to see them buy the stock back. So then it kind of raises, because that's the most tax efficient way to return capital. So then it kind of raises this question of, well, if they put half into buybacks, half into Bitcoin, how much incremental value is actually going to come from the Bitcoin at the opportunity cost of buybacks, whereas something like micro strategy, again, because of how it's so aggressively positioned for Bitcoin, it's essentially a leveraged, Bitcoin ETF with a with with Sailor running the show, um, and hence why it's going to trade in a correlated fashion to Bitcoin and probably higher than Bitcoin. But the the chart pattern will look pretty much the same. Meta could never achieve that that outcome, even if they bought more Bitcoin than than what MicroStrategy has. You know, right, right, yeah, they're not going to trade as a Bitcoin company. Right, yeah. right, right. So uh, what I've got on the screen here is a, is a super fun chart. I put this one together the other day. Uh, I, I I truly think like where, like where we're at today is like this little blip down here in October. And uh, right, because the, the having happened here, MicroStrategy had been buying Bitcoin in this entire period here. They announced for the first time on September 17th that they purchased 21,454 Bitcoin. Um, over 78,000 transactions, which is crazy. Um, and uh, and then the price kind of consolidated and we saw some significant increases here. And then it took off to the moon once uh, the price of the underlying price of Bitcoin started rocketing. So kind of what I think has happened there people that were early on Bitcoin 
were piling into MicroStrategy to get some kind of leverage returns because they know this was going to go crazy. Um, and I think that really kind of pumped the price here. And then it had some sort of regression to the mean trajectory. Um, and, you know, I, I did share this chart. This one's like hard. It's hard to consider. Whoa, shit. It's hard to con it's hard to conceptualize, but um, I think it can help put into perspective passive buy side volume. Um, so the red line here, this is the micro strategy price. This blue line, kind of green line, this is the net asset trading multiple on market cap, and this like hard to see green line here this is the Bitcoin price. And so um, I posted this. This is on my Twitter. And it's got some timestamps and stuff. It looks way better than what this looks like. But um, the Russell index is rebalanced in April every year. They have a they have a ranking event, and it happens in April every year. And so in April 2020, you could look at where the MicroStrategy price was. It's kind of down here, you know, 150 territory. The COVID then, sell off, yeah. The COVID sell off, yeah. And and then you fast forward to 2021. And you look at the, where the April of 2021, the price of MicroStrategy is almost 10x where it was the April of the prior year. So the price of MicroStrategy, or the relative weight that MicroStrategy had in the Russell 2000 index increased by 10 times. And I think you can see here in the just the visually, uh, and you can see it with the trading multiple of net asset value, that uh, there was significant amount of passive flows that started flowing into MicroStrategy at a, at a different weighting per percentage. And I think that resulted in MicroStrategy not, it's not seeing as big of a drawdown on their stock price in this kind of like middle, middle uh, I don't even know what I'd call this, like a, can ahead. I just pause you real quick? Okay, we're back. All right. So, uh, you know, I, I think MicroStrategy got the benefit of the increased um, allocation uh, to the Russell 2000 index. And I, I think they saw less of a decrease uh, when they had this big Bitcoin drawdown in the, in the middle of uh, the bull market, the last bull market. So just something, just something to be aware of. I think it's... Um, it has happened. It is happening. It will happen into perpetuity. They are a equity that's traded in multiple uh, market cap weighted indexes. They will be traded in multiple market cap weighted indexes moving forward. So, uh, and uh, yeah, I love this chart. I, I think we're. I think it's only. I think it's only up from here. Um, I think we've got a ways to go. That being said, we could see a lot of volatility to the downside. Right? Like we've got. Some hedge funds that have very big short positions, we can see we could see massive liquidations in any one given day. Like we we might see uh, companies try to sell off a bunch of stocks really quickly um, to scare investors and shake people out. Um, and I think that will happen, right? Like people will people will get nervous with this trade. Um, there's there's a lot of risks associated with it. If anybody's curious about what the risks are, go read the 10K. I think there's like 15, 15 pages of risks associated with the trade. And all of them are super prudent or super um, relevant. You also have main man risk. Um, but then again, any of these other companies that are in the top 10 also have main man risk. So there's a lot going on. Um, there's risk in any trade. Uh, I feel comfortable st stomaching some of this risk. Uh, luckily, I've um, taken a very strong position. In early 23 so I, I feel I'm, I'm in feeling pretty good I'm pretty pretty solid with where I'm at and where this could go so um I think that's I think that's pretty much all I've got did I answer all my questions um yeah I think that's pretty much it <clears throat> so uh I know unless Ryan you got any other questions I, I know um yeah, I'll, you know, I'll scroll down to this picture too because I love this. Made this one. Um, 
we've got a big wave coming in here. <laughs> and any, anybody that's in MicroStrategy right now, we are riding this wave and it is potentially huge uh, <laughs> and kind of crazy. Anybody that's in the ETF, they're kind of like up here. Notice the gold investors are way out to sea. Uh, most of TradFi Twitter is just sitting and walking by. I think I got a tweet um, in the meantime while we were making this video that was saying, Google Michael Saylor in 2020, he's so, or in 2000, he's so corrupt. It's like, yeah, people learn shit over, you know, quarter of a century, 25 years. Um, he's brilliant. He's a genius. Uh, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, anyway, I, I think we're going to do this in the future too. Maybe bring some people on, talk about some stuff. I mean, yeah. obviously this one, this one was like, this is very in depth. Uh, let me stop my screen share. Obviously a lot going on. Um, a very, very, uh, it's a fun equity to try to analyze. Uh, nothing, nothing has ever uh, been in this position before. And it's fun to think about ways to value a company in a way that has never been valued before and how to look at it relative to other companies and, and how it should be valued relative to other companies. It's kind of fun. So um, I know other people also look at this very differently. They, they look at power laws and they look at relativities and they look at different perspectives, but this is one way to skin the cat. Yeah. And I think, um, so, so I'm of course aligned across the board with, we are going to talk about the risks in the future. We are going to kind of like bake them into like each, each point, each topic, I definitely do want to do um, interviews with folks. And one quick um, note on the interviews is I fully respect that many people want to remain anonymous on Twitter. I, I was anonymous for years on a totally separate account just to kind of protect my professional identity, so to speak. So if people want to come on, you don't have to put camera on. You can just leave like your little Twitter picture be up the whole time and we can talk about that stuff. But other things that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about the short squeeze dynamics. We're going to be talking about the software business. We're going to be speculating a bit on potential ways in which the um, underlying business could grow. Um, and I think the best way to kick some of that stuff off is I have a fair amount of videos of like Fong Lee, who's the current CEO, and a number of other executives explaining things like MicroStrategy One or I would start with the Fong video who explains micro strategy from like start to finish and then look at the micro strategy AI product, the BI product, hyper or hyper intelligence. Um, so there's, there's a lot to this story. And I think between concepts like what Jeff kind of kept touching on, was, which was the flywheel concept and the fact that we have all of these catalysts happening at once and this isn't an enterprise such as something like Tesla, where Tesla is essentially like 20 companies in one. And I mentioned this on the space that, that you and I led the other day that like it, it would take someone like two full years of their time to really have like an expert understanding of, of <laughs> all of the dynamics of Tesla and all of the supply chains involved with each of them and the material sourcing, the lithium refining and, and all this stuff. And that's great. Don't get me wrong, but with something like micro strategy, with corporate analysts such as me and Jeff, who kind of have like a business intelligence, quant, data science um, background, that helps us understand the relatively easy to understand underlying BI business. And then, you know, calculating into that the the value of the Bitcoin holdings, it becomes like a manageable task for one person, especially for the two of us. And we're able to unpack like the dynamics of all of these things, like the Vega and Gamma jump risk. Um, like I said, we talked about the shorts or we're going to talk more about the shorts, the potential short squeeze, the software business. Um, the founder as being the chairman dynamic and, and what those little nuances look like of all of Sailor's videos being translated into all of the languages, many of which are countries that cannot access the spot Bitcoin US ETF, but they can buy micro strategy. 
Um, so again, combining all of these epic catalysts into one, S&P 500 inclusion, NASDAQ inclusion, plus all the heavy hitting shareholders that we have involved. I mean, it, it, it's an incredibly compelling story, especially when at this point in the game, when we are seeing four digit micro strategy being in the thousands, but then we think about the multiple on net asset value is two and a half. So again, I think it's a very dangerous way of thinking in this whole like premium to discount value of Bitcoin, because that's just such linear thinking. And I think that's what's led to people like pounding the table being like, all right, micro strategies overvalued at 720. Let's sell more shares here. It's like, what? why? It, it can go like materially higher and we can sell shares at a higher price. And I know that's a lot of cost benefit analysis and trade-off type stuff. But again, I think in closing for me, this is not, none of this is financial advice, but me and Jeff are very um, optimistic and, and bold up on this company for all the reasons that we've been talking about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. This has been fun. Uh, it's been fun sharing. I hope, I hope people have feedback, like, please, Please talk to us about this. This is this has been super fun to think about and and try to try to break too. Um, yeah. I, I I love it. Cool. Well, I look forward to doing future talks with people and um, and going through more of these topics. I think uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. So one one other quick kind of housekeeping item on that. We are going to plan to do more of these. Maybe me and Jeff can do something where like he kind of leads like what she did today. And then maybe like I kind of lead. So that way, like the work is like evenly distributed there. And then we are going to do a space every once in a while as well, just so that the focus of that and that way we won't have to worry about the share screen stuff on that because people can just get that offline on their own time. And then the space can really just focus on like Q and A, let the audience kind of lead the discussion, especially if they've been watching our stuff, it can be a really rich discussion. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna look to interview people and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it one day at a time and we'll have a little bit of fun with it too. Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. Right so yeah, I, <laughs> I think I'm good if you're good. Yeah, let's uh, yeah, we cut it there. Right on. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>